night. Breaking addiction with Kratom. I feel normal even even through going through with trials. Up close with Iran's nukes. And how much we should trust Elon Musk. Police are investigating what caused an explosion at a fireworks factory outside Indonesia's capital. Of the more than 100 people who worked there, at least 47 were killed. Dozens more are being treated for severe burns, and some workers are still missing. The factory's roof collapsed in the explosion, trapping people inside, as a fire engulfed the building and set off smaller blasts. After violence broke out during Kenya's presidential election today, a do-over of a previous election nullified over irregularities, electoral officials postponed voting in four provinces until Saturday. At least three people were killed as police confronted supporters of opposition leader Rilo Odinga. They start shooting live bullets to us. Why? 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 Odinga had been running against current president Uhuru Kenyatta, but he withdrew from the race and asked his supporters to boycott the vote. Hundreds of thousands of Thai mourners poured into the streets of Bangkok today to say goodbye to their late king. Pumipo Adoyede ruled the country for 70 years and was the only king most Thai citizens ever knew. Since he died last October, Thailand has been officially mourning for a year. His cremation ceremony took place today marking the end of that mourning period. Twitter announced that it's immediately removing all ads for the Kremlin-funded media outlets RT and Sputnik. The company says the decision is based on its own internal investigation and the U.S. intelligence community's conclusion that both outlets tried to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. In response, Sputnik and RT tweeted Russian government reactions that the move is a violation of free speech and that the Kremlin will retaliate. Twitter's decision comes less than a week before the company is scheduled to testify in Congress to answer questions about Russian social media interference in last year's election. Today, President Trump broke a dramatic promise he made back on August 10th. The opioid crisis is an emergency, and I'm saying officially right now, it is an emergency. It's a national emergency. We're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money on the opioid crisis. Declaring it a national emergency would have unleashed billions in federal funds to fight the crisis now killing more people than AIDS at its peak. But he never did. And this afternoon, he officially declared the crisis a public health emergency a lesser designation that only gives states more power over how they use existing federal funds. A number of states have reached out to us asking for relief, and you should expect to see approvals that will unlock treatment for people in need, and those approvals will come very, very fast, not like in the past, very, very quickly. The lack of an adequate federal response for hundreds of thousands of addicted Americans means that many might be forced to find their own desperate solutions. And for some, that answer is a natural drug called kratom. For centuries in Southeast Asia, people have used the leaves of the kratom tree to treat opiate addiction. Kratom is available in the U.S. and cheap at just a dollar or two per dose. But it's also unregulated, often adulterated, and has been linked to several fatalities. A few states have made it illegal, and last year, the DEA came close to imposing a national ban. But despite the risks, more and more Americans are turning to the barely understood drug to break their addictions. I don't want to go to rehab. I've done that. I've done Suboxone. I've done Methadone. Uh, this time I want to try uh, the Kratom. 
One time my parents got me enrolled to a methadone clinic. Oh my God, it's seriously, like getting enrolled to a methadone clinic is the worst experience you ever have. Like they're all fucking day, sick as fuck, waiting for you to get like all your shit approved so you can get your first dose. You're just changing out a dependency for something else. And it's just, it costs just as much. Honestly, like those 15 bucks you spend a day there, you could just be getting a sack. When I OD'd, you just see everything fade to black, basically. Everything slowly, like, fades black, like, your vision. And then, like, I could hear the person that was with me, like, yelling my name, and I just, like, hear your, his voice fading out. And then, I guess the ambulance brought me back, and I was like, damn, I want to go to the hospital. <laughs> I feel it. But yeah, this is stupid. Like, fuck you, I'm never gonna grow up if I keep doing this shit. I think Kratom is a good option this time. I tried it before one time when I was with, withdrawing a couple of times. Generally, it made me feel like 70 to 90% better from the withdrawals. I do think it, it, it can, um, I can use it as a tool to get clean. Seal that. Trash is coming tomorrow, so they're gonna pick that shit up. It's gonna be gone. And that's that. All right, that's five grams right there. When I wake up, it's, it's usually the hardest thing. I'm really gonna be hurt. I'm gonna be hurting. I'm gonna be like, not not wanting to get out of bed. If I take this upon waking up, um, it should keep me well for a good six hours. This morning, I had my tea prepared, so I drank that right away. And then somewhat of a, a little mental battle ensued there. Once One part of me is telling you, you know, stick stick to the plan, stick to the plan. And then the other part's just telling me, you know, it, just, just get high. Basically, I went to the trash can, found my syringe and recovered two cottons. Uh, I basically sponged that up and, and, and got myself a little cleanup shot out of that. We're kind of back to square one, starting over, but it's it's okay. It, it happens, and I'm gonna try again tomorrow. So this morning I woke up around seven. I had um, goosebumps. I was yawning a lot. I had the runny nose. Um, really sensitive to the cold, had a robe and a beanie on and everything. So um, after about 30 minutes of me taking the tea, I, I kind of noticed everything went away. As you can see now, I don't have any goosebumps. My nose isn't really running at all. I'm pretty stable, I would say. So I'm just going to try to keep this up the rest of the day. I plan on redosing again, probably about three hours from now. Probably my first day clean in about like three months. Now that's around the five hour mark. I'm starting to get sensitive to the cold again. I did have the runny nose come back a little bit. Um, the goosebumps, they're creeping back in basically as, as the effects are, are going away. <laughs> Most people would be like banging their head against the wall or searching the carpet. I just have my mind trying to trick me a little bit since it is the early stages, but that's that's something I can deal with. I feel normal even even through going through withdrawals. My body is detoxing uh, the heroin out and I still feel fine. They're, it's been out of my system for a little over 24 hours now. We actually started looking at Kratom back in 2003, before it was ever really on anybody's radar screen in the U.S. When we got the profile back of mitragyne and the major alkaloid from Kratom, it was interacting with opioid receptors, which we, we assumed it would, but it was interacting with other targets that are known to be involved in drug abuse, also in pain transmission, 
uh, and also in withdrawal. We saw it blocking withdrawal symptoms in mice. We started to get really excited about that. And what we're seeing in our hands for the first time is that mitragynin does not seem to have addictive potential or abuse potential. Ultimately, it would be great to show a head-to-head -head comparison to methadone or buprenorphine suboxone and have an alternative there that is not addictive in and of itself. If we go back and look at traditional use, there's never been one reported death in Thailand or Malaysia or Southeast Asia from Kratom alone. Once we move into the United States, we really don't know where the product's coming from. And we really look at it as a buyer beware marketplace right now. So it's been three weeks now since I've been clean from heroin. I still am taking Kratom. Overall, the withdrawals are really, really mild. I did feel really unmotivated and just very apathetic for a few days. Uh, there was a few days where I was just laying in my bed uh, just for like 14 hours straight. But after that, uh, I had no symptoms at all. Right now, I feel perfect. Um, I just plan to keep staying busy. I found boredom was a huge trigger. I am saving up to go to Universal Studios uh, this Halloween as kind of a reward uh, for being clean. Scott Lloyd is the head of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, a federal agency tasked with helping refugees become integrated in American society. So the fact that Lloyd testified today before the House Judiciary Subcommittee is not surprising on its own. But today, there was a line of protesters waiting outside the door because Lloyd is now notorious for his role in the just concluded Jane Doe case, in which he tried and failed to prevent an undocumented teenager from having an abortion. To sum up his testimony, he got brutalized. It's a yes or no question, Mr. Lloyd. Do you believe that a woman's constitutional right to abortion depends on her immigration status, yes or no? A number of uh, rights. Uh, that is not a yes or no any, answer, well, Mr. My, my Lloyd. My answer is that any number of rights depend on um, the, where they stand in, in terms of our immigration system. I do not understand that answer. Is that a yes or a no? I'll take that as a no. What alarmed lawmakers was the recent revelation that over the past six months, Lloyd has used his role as the head of a federal agency to direct the reproductive lives of minors in federal custody. According to emails and documents made public by the ACLU, before Lloyd became ORR director, he traveled to a San Antonio shelter to meet with a pregnant Honduran minor. He then sent an email to shelter staff asking them to accommodate the girl's requests for bananas and more comfortable sleeping conditions. Though the girl had a family member interested in taking care of her, Lloyd offered to connect her instead with families who could help see her through her pregnancy. In another email, Lloyd warned a subordinate that ORR supervised facilities should support no abortion services, only life-affirming option counseling. Lloyd's approach is unusual. When I was present at ORR, I would not have been involved with an individual case at that level. It did not happen when I was there, and I had not heard of it happening previously. I think it would be out of the ordinary. For Lloyd, though, this is just an extension of a career made advocating a pro-life agenda. As a young law student, Lloyd assisted in the Terry Schiavo case, in which he fought against a husband's wishes to remove a vegetative patient from life support. He later worked with anti-abortion group Americans United for Life. During the Bush administration, he helped write the conscience rule, which made it legal for doctors to refuse to perform services like abortion if they believed they were morally wrong. Lloyd has published pieces on the evils of abortion and contraception. He once suggested women on subsidized birth control should have to promise not to have an abortion if the contraception fails. But pro-life advocacy is not refugee policy. So Lloyd's appointment to work on refugee resettlement raises questions about the injection of ideology into key positions in the Trump administration. And though Lloyd failed to block Jane Doe's abortion, pro-life advocates have succeeded in shaping government policy. A new draft of the Department of Health and Human Services strategic plan calls for support of Americans at every stage of life, beginning at conception.
The U.S. House of Representatives passed non-nuclear sanctions on Iran today, targeting the country's ballistic missile program and support for Hezbollah. There's also a push to officially designate the Quds Force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Those are significant moves, but neither will touch the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal. That multilateral agreement put in place by Obama in 2015 lifted crippling sanctions against Iran in return for regular inspections of its nuclear facilities. Trump has made the destruction of that deal a centerpiece of his presidency. And I don't think you've heard the last of it, believe me. This is the Karanj Nuclear Research Center, 40 miles outside of Tehran. The facility is under IAEA inspection, and scientists here say they're in full compliance with the terms of the nuclear deal. What is this? Here, as you see, this is a cyclotron machine. This is one of the type of accelerators. Top Iranian nuclear officials say they were taken by surprise with President Trump's decision last week to decertify the deal. They didn't actually take him seriously. So you're, you're saying you weren't expecting this? this Surprise, is... because you see, uh, we think that no matter who is going to be in Helm, usually the one who is in Helm has to react in a rational way. So what, what do you understand as the, the, the problems that President Trump has with your adherence to that program. I mean, what, what is he saying you're not doing? Nobody knows. You see, the, the, what he is saying is not convincing anybody. But there's a warning that if the agreement goes away for good, the Iranians have a contingency plan already in place. We have taken into consideration the worst scenario and worst situation. So there is a plan B if, if, if the president does decide to tear up this agreement? Yeah, there have been from beginning always a plan B, because we don't, of course, have confidence on the American administration. From the Trump administration's standpoint, one problem with the deal was that it didn't curb Iran's ballistic missile program or restrict the influence its elite Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has brought to bear in the region. Ali Shamkhani is one of the most powerful military figures in Iran. He's head of the Supreme National Security Council and an advisor to the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. This is the first time Sham Khani has talked to an American network in his current position. What's your overall message to the American side as they consider what measures to take next? Iran is a shikast Iran has the run her tahdidi for sat baroy khodash misazat. Vaz e dakhlimun ba tabajjuh be en ekasi ke nisbat be sukhanat Trump mardom ro peyda kerdan be ma dikte mikone ke maqabal zurgui beist. Decertification has been a boon for conservative hardliners who were skeptical about the nuclear deal from the beginning. The fear is that President Trump's decision will weaken the reformist, progressive wing of Iranian politics that was responsible for signing the deal in the first place. And that could impact the people that helped propel reformist President Rouhani to victory in May's election on a platform of engagement with the US. People like Hadi Saidi, who runs an underground tattoo studio out of his bedroom in the outskirts of Tehran. He charges an average of $100 a hit to customers he finds online, thanks to looser internet restrictions here over the past few years. Tattooing isn't illegal in Iran, but it can still get you into trouble. Hadi says almost all his clientele get inked on parts of their body that are hidden. آزادی میره این کار یه مقدار ولی بازم مثلا به خود من خیلی مثلا گیر میدم به خاطر تاتوی که دارم ولی خیلی بهتر از چند سال قبل شده یعنی یه تغییرایی توش من احساس میکنم 
Hadi's friend Mehdi Mohammedian is getting his tattoo here since he works at a public institution where it's still not accepted. If President Trump and the Iranian government continue to have these, these, these issues, are you worried that things could change with, with social attitudes again for the, for the worse? I don't think it's bad. It's better than it is. And we like this story, this relationship with our relationship with America is better than it is. It's true that the relationship with the relationship مسائل سیاسی که توی جامعه پیش میاد بالاخره تو کار با هم تاثیر خودش میذاره دیگه کنم بگن اصلا هیچ کس نباید تتو داشته باشه دیگه این یه مسئله دیگه اگه واقعا اینجوری بشه که من خودم دیگه باید برم واقعا از ایران Tesla CEO Elon Musk told shareholders that a prototype of a fully electric semi truck would be ready in September but then the semi was delayed. Elon Musk tweeting last night, Tesla semi truck unveil and test ride tentatively scheduled for October 26th in Hawthorne. Worth seeing this beast in person. It's unreal. It was supposed to come out today, except there's been another setback. <laughs> Musk is prone to bold pronouncements. He's announced plans to build a big fucking rocket capable of flying from New York to Shanghai in 39 minutes. That same rocket could get an unmanned mission to Mars by 2022 and humans on the red planet by 2024. I feel fairly confident that we can complete the ship and be ready for a launch in about five years. Five years seems like a long time to me. But amidst all the starry promises, how does Musk perform on the dull matter of actually hitting his self-proclaimed deadlines? The Falcon Heavy, SpaceX's giant rocket that straps together three Falcon 9 rockets was first announced in 2011. I think most likely what, 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 what you'll see is ro rocket at the pad towards the end of next year um, and then a launch sometime uh, uh, in, in uh, 2013. Six years since it was initially introduced, SpaceX still hasn't launched Falcon Heavy. It actually ended up being way, way harder to do Falcon Heavy than we thought. Because uh, at, at first it sounds real easy. You just stick two first stages on as strap-on boosters. Man, how, how hard can that be? In 2011, SpaceX said its Dragon spacecraft would be ready to fly its first manned mission in 2014. But by 2014, SpaceX was only just revealing a spacecraft capable of taking people into space and was nowhere close to launching it. The Dragon version 2, uh, capable of carrying up to seven astronauts, uh, propulsively landing uh, almost anywhere in the world. Earlier this year, SpaceX scaled back expectations of a crewed mission yet again. Tesla, Musk's electric car company, is also chronically tardy. And there has been delay after delay after delay for the Model 3. Here we have a company that has missed every launch date by years and every production commitment significantly. Hey, they're always late when it comes to getting vehicles out on time. And investors are so used to that that uh, maybe it won't be a problem for them. It hasn't been so far. SpaceX is one of the most valuable privately held companies, and Tesla's market cap rivals those of other major car makers. Hi, my name is Maggie Batts, and I am the writer and director of No Bishit. You'll be spending the next six months as postulants. After that, you'll enter the novitiate. Any questions? Put your hand down, sister. Postulants don't have questions. And you are free to go home. The movie is about a young girl who goes into a training program to become a nun in the early 1960s, at the same time period of something called Vatican II, which created a period of great reform in the Catholic Church. I just happen to disagree with it, all of it. Not to mention, it's a slap in the face that the sisters weren't given any voice in the matter. I read a biography of Mother Teresa. I was getting on a plane and I like realized that I didn't have anything good to read and I think it was right around the time that she had died. I thought it'd be boring probably. What fascinated me most about it was the intensity and passion and sort of romantic nature of her relationship with God and how much it seemed very similar to love relationships that I've seen or experienced myself between two people. I was like, okay, I, I want to make a movie about nuns. And I think what compelled me was like, one, that I could make a movie about love, which was like my favorite topic, and two, 
that I could have an almost all female cast, which was like my biggest dream. Melissa showed up the first week of rehearsal. She came over to my house that I was staying in at nine in the morning on a Sunday and stayed 12 hours. And I remember at one point, it was like maybe three or something like that. And I was like, hey, I was like, do you want to have lunch? And she's like, lunch, we're working here. I was like, wow, Melissa works harder than I work. I'm accusing myself of being intimate with someone. Intimate? With another sister, feeling love for her. And I don't think it was a sin. I don't think it was a sin because it didn't feel like a sin. It felt like I'm supposed to feel. We had seven days before we started shooting, which was called Nun Camp, and all the young girls arrived, and they were taught how to walk, they were taught how to pray, they were taught this sort of disciplined choreography of nuns or of taking communion or things like that. People like naturally crack a lot of jokes and stuff when they put on a habit, or they'll make little rap videos, or once you put on a habit, it's like, it's just nonstop silliness. So we had a former nun who was our tech advisor, Tech advisor in on any movie is like somebody who really comes from that world who's just kind of sitting behind monitor with the director and watching everything as it's going on and checking for authenticity. One time she caught an extra in a dining room scene was like eating really voraciously and little things that I never would have found in the research where she's like, no, nuns are supposed to eat in a very ladylike way. And if I could dedicate the movie to anyone, I, I would dedicate it to this lost community of women. It was like wiped out by Vatican II, but it was this incredibly sort of sacrificial, profound, self-contained community of women that once was that doesn't really exist anymore. And in a way, like I'd like the movie to be a requiem to a lost world of women. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, October 26th. 